for a while, but, and you can see how just like garlic, it has these little bulbules that, that grow, that break off of it in pieces. So these are great, again, you know, like knock off all the dirt and then soak them overnight because they, you don't have to soak them, but I just find it easier to get the dirt layer off the outside the next day. Um, came along for the ride. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, all right, there's so many things here. I get a little distracted. Um, uh, quick, quick question for you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, this is Andrea. Thank you for Hi, doing Andrea. Mm -hmm. uh, question, you said you use this to make stocks. You- um, Oh, soup it, stock. Soup stocks. So it's mm -hmm. too rough and fibrous to eat, right? You wouldn't put that in your- Well, I eat the base uh, and in the early spring and right now, Sorry, I'm Christophe's like waving at me to look at the camera because um, I'm always fascinated by looking down at the plants. I tend to walk that way too. Um, so it's really dependent on how soft they are. So right now, some of these tall ones that we just got, the white part as you go up the stem is still soft. So you can use all of that chopped up. But the, the green part tends to be really, really rough in the overwintered part, really tough. Mm -hmm. But sometimes of the year, it, the whole thing you can use. Mm -hmm. So it just depends on, I think, probably which year's growth it is, too. Mm -hmm. Heather, I want to clarify the blue flower, the chives. Okay. chives. Chives have a different color flower. You are right. Yeah. Edible. Yeah. On um, so, so all of right here in this next bed, which there's an enemy of the farmer some, in, some, in some cases, but not here at Dig. They tend to respect all plants in nature. And this is an invasive plant, um, mugwort. And mugwort is pretty intense. I, I didn't appreciate mugwort for years. I appreciate it in Chinese medicine. I knew it in Chinese medicine where um, they actually use it like at... Um, make tea out of it and pour the tea over your body in some ritual or burn it in acupuncture. Um, the moxibustion um, is made out of dried and a paste of mugwort. But we have, it's a Artemisia. So some people, if you're into herbal medicine might know it as Artemisinin, Artemisia or wormwood um, that is used for fighting parasites, but also some symptoms of Lyme disease. But it's also been used in many cultures. They say that making a tea of this and drinking it induces vivid dreams. So if you're spiritually looking to do dream work and get an idea of that. The thing that I never realized is that it's taste, it's an aromatic herb. So you can use it like you, you try it out and use it like you would oregano or one of those aromatic herbs. So, and it smells when you crush it, smells pretty wonderful. Yeah. So I have a whole new appreciation for this. It can be used as an insect yeah. repellent, actually. They don't like the smell of it. Mm -hmm. Do you know how it got the name of wort? I do not. So wort is simply an old English word that means plant. So in this case, translated literally, this is just mug plant. And actually, in England, before the importation of hops from the European mainland, this plant was widely used to flavor beer. Yes, I knew that. Mm -hmm. Oh, you knew that. <laughs> that I knew. I don't to know. flavor beer. Oh, and that reminds me. It's a nice flavor. It <laughs> is used by this book I'll show you. Marie Viljean makes these. Um, she makes vermouth, a wild vermouth with it. She makes her own vermouth. And then she makes all these drinks and I can't wait to try some of these new ideas. And the other thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I have two questions uh, yeah. for, for Matthew. Matthew? Yes. Do you, maybe we can have Matthew announce the Latin names if he knows them of the yeah. plants that we talk about. And then do you, Heather mentioned the, uh, some of the properties of this about dream work and mm -hmm. things like that. Do you know what? part of the plant uh, does that and why? So the scientific name for this, like Heather said, is Artemisia. The uh, full name is Artemisia vulgaris. Common. Common. 
uh, it's, it's interesting. Some people say that the name Artemisia came from the goddess Artemis, but there's also a different school of thought that they were named after Artemisia II, who was a queen botanist, a doctor, and a naval official <laughs> in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, she was uh, one of the only sort of big name women of science at the time. And so some people ah. speculate that this plant was actually named after her and not huh. the goddess instead. Huh. Uh, so I'm not sure what the exact active compounds in it are. I will be honest, most of my experience with this plant is fighting desperately to get rid of it. <laughs> it is, this is just about one of the meanest plants in the world. Uh, it's a real pain, especially if you're doing any kind of restoration work. So I work on restoration projects where we remove invasive species and replant natives. This is one of the hardest to deal with. <laughs> if you have it in a bed, really the only way to get rid of it is just repeated mowing. If you pull it, you just make it angry. And when it's angry, it just grows twice as fast. <laughs> so for a different farmer perspective on that, <laughs> because, because that is what I've always heard about this plant. So I was thrilled to find um, all these different uses. And once you read this cookbook by Marie, you'll, you'll want to be making artemisian salts and vermouth and different things. But how do you feel, Allison, about-, about, I mean, about... Uh, That's the traditional take on mugwort yeah. is that, you know, but again, we try to, and this is why I love having Heather here right now because there's so much to learn. And there's, um, you know, I feel like everything has a purpose in some way, whether it's pulling some sort of a toxin out of the soil or doing something to balance and level everything out. Um, so, you know, again, we have it here. So now as we learn about it, we can have even more appreciation for it. And um, I mean, the, one of the things just, about it, I mean, the it. reason why it's such a problem is that it's able to capitalize on human disturbance very easily. So especially it tolerates road salt, it tolerates mm. degraded soil alkaline conditions that yep. come from a lot of the way we treat roadsides and construction projects. And so what ends up happening is we create the perfect conditions for this plant to come in. And unfortunately, when it comes in, it locks out everything else. That's the problem. That's, you know, but it is one that does have, it has a really fascinating human history, a sort of ethnobotanical history. It's a very impressive plant in a lot of ways. It's just not one that in, in my line of work, I have to admit, I'm particularly fond of. <laughs> all right, there you have it, all different, all different things. Can I hear so, right, is this also called wormwood? Yes, the, and okay. you probably know that as an herb. Yeah, okay. Um, so now we're walking through the garlic, last year's garlic bed here, and here's more mugwort that's coming in. This is another prolific plant that I always want to be edible, but I don't know of its edibility. It's um, fleabane. I don't believe that's an edible one, but yeah. that was very good for wildlife. Oh, okay. Really valuable native wildflower. Okay, cool. So one to leave. So it's really hard for me to want to dig up things out of the garden. I'm, uh, I'm not the best with um, cleaning up a garden bed. Yeah. Oh, I think the weeds, but look I at this. Allison, look what you have here. <laughs> Which one do you see here that you would? In the middle. The middle, yeah. So this one's a little shiny, dark green. It's still really young here at the farm. It must be, even though it's so sunny out here. Um, it's really interesting to find like in one town or in one side of the road, depending on the hills and stuff, everything will be in bloom right now or not in bloom or not different sizes right. so it's really interesting and wild things just the same as things that your garden really respond to different conditions but do you know this one Matthew and how would you describe the shape of these leaves so they would be lobed I don't think I know this one this is you probably don't know yeah. it because it's overlooked in the U.S. as an edible so it's got a, a long leaf and very deeply deep, like teeth, I guess, 
but it's lobed, it's rounded at the edges there. Um, it's one of the most delicious spring grains. It's chrysanthemum. Interesting. And so in, in other countries, this is a prized green and more cultivated. So they get bigger because they, I'm sure there's other varieties, just like varieties that you would grow. Of chrysanthemum? Well, uh, if you're growing it for the green, I imagine it gets cultivated oh, yeah. in a different manner and bred yeah. in a different manner. Space property. Space property. Like, this is a deep clump. Yep. How is that very associated tight. with the flower? This gets a wonderful flower. I always leave this and anywhere I find it, I bring it home and plant it around the house because I get greens and then I, and I don't want to cut it all back because I love the little flower. This gets the wild chrysanthemum flower, which is not as sort of impressive as those ones that you might go to the botanical gardens to see on the chrysanthemum <laughs> show, you know, where there's very intense lots of, in, in Japan, they're really used for decoration stuff, but this is a delicious green, um, very similar to arugula, but grows by itself. All, and I guess, I don't think it's native. It's not. Yeah. So I think that's a, go ahead. Just, we're just giving you a time update. It's 11.30 now. Okay. Well, we got a few more <laughs> plants to get through. But while I think about where to walk next, Allison, could you explain, Christoph, could you get a view of how this, what's going on here with this V-shaped mm -hmm. thing on this hill? So it's not a wild plant, but they've got elderberry yeah, over there. And it talked to Heather and then I'll oh. walk around again. Oh, I see. Okay. So they can hear? Yeah, so they can hear. I have a microphone yeah. here hidden in this. So. Um, so last season, it was the perfect time to do it. We did a full renovation of the land here at Dig Farm and we did everything on contour <laughs> because we have a slight gradual um, slope to the land. So we utilized permaculture practices of trenches and swales and then on contour to build permanent beds that we can focus on building up the soil within those beds and not disturbing the soil to continue to grow and nurture all the good bacteria and fungi and microbes and all of the good things in the soil that you wanna to continue to grow as opposed to till up every season and break that structure down. So, so this is no till and no it's got till. hills and swales. Or uh, yep, swales and trenches. Swales and trenches. So yep. the swales, the up part and the trench, is the you can't really tell is a trench right now because you filled it with wood chips. Correct. So the idea is right that it's trapping water. Yes. The so you water less. It's um, doing like a spread and sink. So as opposed to water channeling down on a hill, it naturally water is going to channel together and flow down the hill. So this kind of breaks it up with the deeper <clears throat> trenches to allow it to sink and spread to help maintenance the water on a long term level. Okay. So it so this design can if it rains like crazy, uh, this can hold a lot of water. And then that will sink it in deeper, which means that it will stay there longer through a dryer spell. Wonderful. Yep. We have serious water problems at our house on a hill, and we're we've got three little tiny beds built like this, but you know they're very small <laughs> compared to them. Fun. They're they're fun to grow in like this, and um, you know, like I said, oh. we just did this one, so we concentrating on building up the soil. And it is a working farm, so the noise you hear in the background is the tractor going over there. We're going to walk over this way and look at your beds over on the other side. And while we're doing that, if people want to ask questions, oh, look at all your yellows. So um, people have questions. I have a question. When you yeah. when you when you dig something up, how do you um, maintain its freshness? Because it seems like those things wilt so quickly. And uh, how do you preserve it to eat it? 
Hmm, good question. It depends on the plant. Some of them sort of revive in water. And I, I if I'm digging up by the root, once you put the root in the water, it revives. Um, I tend to come home and try to wash things. <laughs> I'm a little lax and sometimes I pick too much for myself to process. So it might take 24 hours to process something. Um, how are we doing on the Wi-Fi? Is it still clear here? Yes. 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 All the way yes. yes. Oh, this bed, this bed's gone. There was a bed here we were going to look at. <laughs> this one's just been dug up. <laughs> you can see the volunteers here working here. Um, let's see. I've forgotten. Oh, there was chickweed here. There's a little bit of chickweed. Hmm. And lambs quarters. Where were they? Yeah. Wanna. Oh, with that motherwort, yeah. Um, this plant right here, Christoph, is an <laughs> herb plant used in herbal medicine, motherwort. Um, so it's got used, it's very bitter. And it's used for liver and, and other things. It's also used sort of in ritual applications, but um, not one that I've ever heard of using to eat because, again, it's super bitter. Um, and... We've got a curly leaf dock here. This can be eaten. Nice in the spring, chopped up, use it in soups or whatever, or just eat it, nice flavor. But as opposed to bitter dock, which is growing all over right here. Um, I know I've seen a lot as we've, we've Oh, we just lost the sound. Yeah. Heather, we're not hearing you. It said Heather was made the host right at the time that we lost the sound. Oh, geez. Um, Heather is off. <laughs> totally. Okay. <laughs> Christoph, if you can hear this, we can't hear Heather. Hi, everyone. Heather is still trying to connect, so we're going to take a brief flower break while Heather uh, reconnects her connection. Okay. And I'm back. Oh, Can good. you hear me now? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I guess we just discovered how far away we can go with with the Wi-Fi connection that we set up out in the middle of the form. <laughs> so, oh yeah, I brought some books. Um, this is the book that I was talking about that I'm finding incredibly inspiring. And Allison, I can leave this for you to borrow. Ooh, it. It's one. It's a book worth having in print. Like it is so inspiring and there's um all of these recipes for these common plants like the mugwort and and very complex recipes like making um flavored vinegars but also a lot of cordials wow, a lot of cordials and a lot of um like the vermouth and mixed drinks and um very beautiful like um decorating with things and making pretty specialized um, things with wild plants. And then this one I find great if you happen to live in New York, which I think everybody on the call probably does, um, Foraging New York. This is Steve Brill. He's been around forever um, teaching. He, he, he made a book, I think, in the 70s about identifying wild 
<clears throat> edible and medicinal plants and it had hand drawings, which were just really great. And that's what I mainly use to learn from. But um, this one has pictures. So I like <laughs> these days, you know, photo genes come a long way. We can, we as nettles right now are up, but I haven't seen any here at the farm. Um, and I had the, yeah, I have nettles at home, but I had the garlic out here to show what Allison will be digging up from her garlic beds in the fall. And I don't know if this has been done, but I imagine that we could figure out how to preserve the wild garlic, dry it like this too. Probably. Yeah, so I think I wanna try that this fall. So any questions? <clears throat> if you have qu questions, speak up. Yeah, we do have a question from Karen. Uh, she wants to know what she can do with Japanese knotwood right now. Japanese knotweed. So that's a great question. I love Japanese knotweed. I, and here in Westchester, I haven't found a stand of it that's not either on the side of the road or at the side of a trail where I know there's lots of people and dogs peeing or <laughs> whatever. So, um, I mean, like a busy county trail. It's an invasive plant. Um, and it'll take over whole areas. And one of the best things to do is get rid of it early, cut it down when um, it's under, I'd say, well, it's great to get the very early spring grains when it's like up to eight inches tall. And it, it looks kind of like asparagus, be purplish, red, green, and you cook it very, very lightly, kind of like asparagus, but it more of a lemony flavor almost. Um, but then as the plant gets a little taller, I found that you can cut like the top four to five inches off and use it as long as it's that soft and it's not furled. The leaves, when the leaves are out, it's not um, very useful to eat it. Um, there are people that make medicine out of it. It's, you'll see it in uh, stores now. I think actually is a, another Lyme disease treatment. Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, Regina gave me not weed honey. Not weed honey? Yeah, so honey from where, you know, they forage on the, on the knotweed and it goes into the honey, obviously. Um, oh. And it, uh, she gave it to me with the, you know, that it would help with Lyme disease. Wow. So I take a little bit every day. Huh. <laughs> so I just learned something new. Regina is walking towards us now and she's the beekeeper here and at many places in the area. Um, say hi, Regina. <laughs> she's uh, uh she teaches about beekeeping and things um this was a fortuitous thing um i have always you know i hear about harvesting red bud um and i generally when i've seen it i can't reach the branches <laughs> so I never get any and I'll, I'll have Matthew talk about identifying this this tree but obviously the flowers are out right now in our area and you can um, decorate with these and people make all different recipes Marie Phil Jones got some in her book with red bud and this is my first time and when I got here this morning yeah. Allison's uh some I guess uh far, one of the other farmers or something was trimming a red bud tree and I saw it go in his truck and I said oh my gosh yeah <laughs> so yeah so Christoph do you think you can come over here I want to show off some of the open flowers because a lot of these are still buds and so red bud is a tree, but it's actually in the Fabaceae family, which is the bean mm -hmm. pea family. Yeah. And you can see the resemblance. It has those kind of bilobed flowers, just like a pea plant. Uh, these are a nearby native species. So their natural distribution is a little further south of us, but they grow very well here. They've got these lovely sort of large green heart-shaped leaves, very ornamental all season. They got this kind of gnarly growth habit too, which is always fun. And a nice thing about these is these are an early hummingbird plant. Mm. So these are starting to flower as the hummingbirds are arriving here from Mexico. And this is an early nectar source for them. It's also visited by a number of different bee species. And there is actually a species of specialist bee that only feeds on the flowers of redbud. 
Huh. Yeah, really interesting plants, a lot of wildlife value, incredibly ornamental. Um, you probably, again, over there, you can see, this is where these branches were trimmed from. And they get that really lovely kind of effect. What's neat about these also is that these are coliflorous, which is a fancy way of saying that they actually flower directly from the stem and from along the branches. And so you can see it really, it kind of sheaths the whole plant in this really fabulous magenta. Yeah, and what I like is that it makes it easy to identify mm -hmm. this. This plant here, and we haven't talked about identifying some of the plants that we've been going over. I've been really focused on what we can forage, but also, um, you know, there's if people have questions about identifying certain plants. I know that we have a photo album, and that some people uploaded photos. I saw that somebody uploaded a fiddlehead fern into the pictures, but it's not the type of fiddlehead that I would eat, unfortunately. I'm sorry that to the person who uploaded that. Um, so I like ostrich, fern, and uh, a couple others, but not that one. Um, and and uh, what else was uploaded? Oh, um, somebody told me that they had a picture of a magnolia. And that's when I'm, so every year I try to learn a couple new plants and how to use them and process them. And this year, um, there's some species that are better than others, but magnolia leaves taste mildly of ginger really? and smell. And so you want it in the bud stage or um, so a lot of people pickle the buds. Wow. Yeah. They make refrigerator pickles with the buds. Oh. So the closed buds, but they take the end off. The end is bitter. The, the, the leaf where the leaf's coming around it. Um, and, you know, if you have a beautiful magnolia, you don't, if you only have one, you probably don't want to pick a pick a deep on your, but I had the extreme luck last weekend to visit a friend where the botanical gardens years ago put in a magnolia study on an, on a half an acre of land. Wow. And there's like 30 magnolia trees and most of them are huge now and I couldn't reach them, but there were a few low ones and we were able to all go in and pick some buds and take them home and try them out. And you can slice them, use them in something or just peel off some of the young leaves, which taste fantastic too. And so the thing that I did was make a, a simple syrup. I don't even usually use sugar, but I so wanted to try this boiled some sugar and water, stuck in some chopped up um, leaves, left it, turned it off, didn't boil it, left it for 20 minutes and we tried it, uh, poured into seltzer, it was great. It was great, it was such a nice flavor, it's different than other flavors that we've had. It was really, really um, sort of a joyous thing to try out, yeah. <laughs> a particular kind of magnolia? Um, this one, was I do know what kind, but I can't remember. It was it was one of the more common light pink ones uh -huh. that you see around. It starts off a little more purple and turns yeah light pink. Um, I didn't try because I didn't know. I didn't try the yellow magnolia or the white magnolias that were there, or the and the really dark ones were already gone. Mm -hmm. They were already so. What I noticed in this grove is some of the magnolias a, a week ago were already. Um, butted out and falling all the leaves were falling off yeah. and rotting they for the flowers maybe. yeah so I'm not sure which one that was but I can find out more next time yeah <laughs> okay we do have another question Heather if, if we can um, what, what's the question Lauren wants to know what forage plants can be used in baking baked products foraged plants you're saying yeah well, like what kind like of bake that you could bake, put in baking? Yeah, you can decorate with them. I know people decorate with all kinds of flowers in their baking. I'm not much of a baker. That's probably why you haven't heard me talk much about baking with them. But I know a lot of people use them on um, decorating their baked goods. But I've heard about people using flowers in their cookies and they make cakes where it's cooked inside, where the flowers are cooked inside. More, I've heard a lot about people using seeds from amaranth 
like the lamb's quarters, which we couldn't find today, but I know are here. Um, and I think there's a picture in our Google group of the lamb's quarters. So I could add the name to that picture. Um, and that will get a seed later in the summer. And I know people make crackers with all kinds of wild seeds. Um, there's somebody on the call today who just shared a link and we should share it here, but I thought you'd be interested, Allison and you too, Matthew, about all of the wild plants that we pull out and about adding them to the agricultural planning. Wow, yeah. That's I think that was basically what it's about. Ellen, if you wanna say anything about what that was about, I just didn't get to watch it yet, but I'm really interested in the concept. I'll try to put the, the link in the chat. Great, that'd be great. She's gonna put the link in the chat. Was Ellen. Um, so just for a little treat here, I don't know, Christoph, can we see, go see the chickens? <laughs> oh, this is one thing we were looking for. You're right, Matthew. This is one of the things that we were gonna talk about today. One of my favorite spring greens, absolute favorite. I just love this green because you don't have to cook it. It's super soft. It's up early in the season. It's easy to identify because of its shape and the timing of when it comes out, but also because when you break it, it smells like garlic and it's um, in the mustard family, or there might be another word for that. The brassicaceae. The brassicaceae. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that comes up in one of my, the, the word game I play on the New York yeah. Times. Um, <laughs> be nice and long. But um, it's so delicious in the spring. So this is a very small one of it. Right now, in a lot of, and this is in the shade right here. You can see the afternoon sun's not. There's a lot. Yeah, there. grab a big chunk oh, of it. Can you find some first year plants too so we can show them the difference? Um, so what, where a lot of this is, if you go look at the edges of your yards or anywhere where you can find a field um, where there's a lot of this, um, it grows in the most amazing places. It grows in the, between sidewalks. But um, cracks. It, it, right now it has a little, um, it, it'll look like broccoli rob has a little tiny closed green buds at the top absolutely delicious one set or some places i noticed just yesterday i started seeing white flowers in the field and it's probably these right now yeah um they, the flowers are fabulous in salad these i tend to eat I, um, like i'll have a hot soup or a hot um something hot and i'll cut them and drop them on i don't like them cooked they turn brown very quickly and they lose their flavor if you were to boil them or something they're really nice in pesto you can make a really yes, good pesto people that. make pesto raw um, of this. Oh yeah, so perfect. So this, the other thing you can do with it, and it's always at the right time of year, um, at Passover is you can pull this up and use the root and grate it up to make a homemade, like a homemade horseradish. Right. It's yeah. milder, but it has it's milder. a flavor. Well, it's delicious. So you make it in the same way that you would make horseradish. So you want to find ones with the nice, yeah. the bigger, um, things, uh, the bigger stems, which just like growing cultivated plants like carrots or something, the softer the soil, the more, the bigger this the bigger, and straighter bigger. Yeah. this gets. But you were saying first year, yeah. second year? So this is a biennial, and I don't know how that impacts the flavor, but it's going to look a little different in the first year. In the first year, you're just going to get that basil rosette. So you're just going to get sort of these larger lower leaves, circular rosette at the base. Mm -hmm. And first year plants don't have these tap roots generally, they have a fibrous root system. The second year is when they put out this, this tap root that you can use as a horseradish substitute. And that's when they bolt, they put up a big flower stalk. And then after these plants flower and set seed, they die. So they have a two year life cycle. Okay, uh, so I've noticed that this stem at some types of year is totally soft and I can use like most of the plant stem, but right now the only the very tip is is soft. Yeah, that could be a consequence of where the plant was growing, the age of the plant. Uh, so on farms a lot when it's in, um, so I have one farm that I go forage at and they have this 
place where they've been throwing compost for years mm -hmm. and on the back side of that that they don't use in this trapped area that gets a lot of shade mm -hmm. there's big like these get this tall yeah. before they flowered <laughs> yeah. not after they flowered before they bolted and they have just i can just go through like kind of like saw off just it's like yeah. broccoli rod wow. but more tender with these little green so you know flowers all of it is edible the whole yep but this is hard in here. And again, this is something that I put in stock early because it's out early, which must be last year's growth. Yep. So I find this when there's almost like, you know, just a little snow left on the ground or something. Well, unfortunately, this is like some of the other plants, like the mugwort, this is also an invasive species that mm -hmm. causes a lot of ecological havoc. Uh, this plant is actually directly implicated in the extinction of one of our native butterflies. Oh. So one of our native butterflies, uh, the Virginia white butterfly, Pieris virginiae, is a plant, it is a butterfly that it's very host specific. So it only lays its eggs on toothworts, which are a native species of mustard. And I love toothworts. They're fabulous little plants, but unfortunately, they're one of the first things to disappear when the habitat becomes disturbed. Mm. Toothworts just sort of vanish right away. They're very sensitive to disturbance. Garlic mustard moves in, and what happens is that for the butterfly, you know, butterflies lay their eggs often based on taste. And so to a mother Virginia white butterfly who's looking for a place to lay her eggs, she will taste the garlic mustard. It will taste enough like a toothwort that she will lay her eggs on it. Unfortunately, the caterpillars cannot eat garlic mustard. And so the caterpillars, after they hatch, starve to death. Oh. And Virginia white butterfly populations are plummeting. Uh, they're probably not going to be with us for too much longer. Oh. Is that that little white butterfly that's floating around over there? Over there, that is a cabbage white butterfly, oh, okay. which is a Pieris repay. It's closely related. Okay. The Pieris repay, all of the white butterflies specialize on mustard family plants. But unlike the Virginia white butterfly, which is a specialist, the cabbage white is a generalist. It'll lay on anything in the mustard family, including okay. garlic mustard, which its caterpillars can eat. Oh, okay. But this is one of those things where, you know, you can, you know, we talk about going out and eating the weeds. Pulling up this plant and eating it is a kind of environmental action, right? <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> yeah. All right. So today we've looked at garlic mustard, wild garlic, um, chrysanthemum, purple dead nettle, dandelion. Um, anything else that uh, we looked the at? Pro garlic. Okay. Red bud. Yep. Red bud. Mm hmm. Plantain. Chrysanthemum. Yep. Chrysanthemum. Yeah. Motherwort. Oh, motherwort. Thank you. Oh, can you tell us what, and mugwort. Yeah. Well, yes, my, my lovely mugwort. But can you tell me, would you share what you use the motherwort for? What you've heard about motherwort? Um, what uses? That, uh, you know, Regina is the one that would, but. Motherwort, it's just no, I can't. Okay, I think it was uh, for a ritual, like tea yes, type yes, of yes, yes, yes. thing, yeah. But um, there's some other uses for it, um, but we I don't really it, go. It's kind of like a spiritual tea, spiritual tea, yeah. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's a good definition, <laughs> but um, well, thank you, Allison, thank you, Matthew, thank you. Oh, Goodness, thank you. Ah. That's a treat. <laughs> and thank you, Christoph, there for uh, filming um, and setting up. We had to set up Wi Fi outside here. This was amazing um, to, to, to do this, to film from this. A lot of production going on. <laughs> a lot of production maybe, was going on here. Maybe just recap about Dig Farm and your website. And Absolutely. So um, we are in North Salem. This is Dig Farm that you've been enjoying today on this call. We are a nonprofit teaching farm so you can come out and volunteer so it's a good way like i said if can't, you can't hear you very well you can put in some time and you can't can hear you she says so let me pull out my microphone hold on a second a little production thing going on here. here you can you can talk to me 
Um, okay. So you can come and volunteer on Big Farm, a good way to stock up on some veggies. Everybody that comes takes stuff home with them. Um, if you have kids groups, if you have anybody that needs community service, uh, we are a great place to come and visit. So you can come and check us out. Our website is digfarm.org. Obviously, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Dig Farm. Um, and come check us out and say hello. And what's your cat's Instagram? Oh, of course. <laughs> like the celebrity of the farm, when you come, you will meet Don. And he is Don of Dig Farm on Instagram. And you can follow all of his crazy adventures meeting the deer and seeing all the animals and going through and checking everything out he's the big inspector of the whole place so don of dig farm great thank you thank you all right thank you everybody thank we you, have this Lauren, everybody that was great <laughs> thank you we have it recorded so hopefully we'll be able to get the recording up soon and i'll see you next month thanks heather bye heather <laughs> <laughs> bye Thank you. What a great cooperation. Yeah, well, Heather really like pioneered it last year.